recording. Good morning, everybody. Right. Okay, so hello and welcome to this introduction to R, or as uh, we're titled in the program, uh, Getting to Grips with R. Um, yes, and that's our intention today, just to try and work out what's R, what we can use it for, and get an idea of some of the basic functionality and the syntax and how to work with, with R itself. So without further ado, just uh, so the outline for, um, for this initial bit, I'm gonna give a bit of an introduction to what R is and the kinds of functionality that we're going to be looking at and a couple of hints and tips for working with the R Studio environment. And then we'll move on to what will be basically a um, code along with me um, session, kind of looking at uh, some of the basic functionality of R. And then what we're going to do is there's a couple of exercises in there as well that kind of bring that learning together. So, um, there's lots and lots of content and basically we're going to see how far we can get through it. Um, what we're going to use as the basis for today's session is going to be um, the R for Healthcare website and this can be found at rforhealthcare.org and all of the content that we're going to use for today's training session can be found here including the introductory presentation that i'm going to give and all of the training contents that we're going to be using for today um, and also all of the exercises and there is also a gitlab repository um, which you can download, which has the data for the exercises, the exercises themselves, uh, the presentation, and um, all of the training content in uh, Jupyter notebook form as R files and as PDFs as well. So lots and lots of content there for you to look through in your own time. Um, and yeah, we'll just see how, how far we can get through all this training today. So, R, so basically R started out as, um, it was developed as a free and open source version of what was uh, the S language. And this was a language that was developed specifically for statistical computing back in the 1970s, but it had a proprietary license with it. Um, and that never changed. They never released S as a free language, as far as I know. Um, so basically, uh, Ross and Robert um, at the University of Auckland, um, they developed R as a, a free and open source version of S. And they chose R uh, kind of as a bit of a play on their names, both be it starting with R and having it as um, the letter next to S. What witty people, um, program language developers are. Ha ha ha. And there's plenty of R based puns. I'm sure we'll uh, pick up on a few during the day. And so basically R has been around in a stable version since 2000. So it's 20 years of R this year, um, which, is, which is quite something. It's, it's been around for a long time and it is, it's a useful and powerful language as we'll see. So it's the idea with R and why it's classed as a statistical computing language is that it enables fast, really fast calculation over large matrices because of the way that it does its calculations at the background. Um, and one of the limitations, but one of the things that make it in relatively easy language to learn is that it's purely script based. You can do some object orientation through R, 
but it's primarily designed as a script based language to run um, as when you write uh, just functional Python files, it just runs the code as you go through and you can write user defined functions, but you have to call them. We're not setting up classes or anything like that. Um, it supports all parallel processing and multi-threading um, natively. So it makes the best use of uh, the power that you have on your computer. Um, and you can implement other languages um, such as C, C++, uh, Python, and LaTeX. Um, there are some incredibly powerful um, parts of it uh, where it can link very easily to SQL databases. Um, it, uh, you also have R Markdown, which is a nice way to be able to create uh, documents out of your R files. And uh, there are some um, nice instances of this uh, that can be seen, particularly through um, the NHSR community. Um, this is one I'll, I'll keep mentioning um, throughout. In fact, I should have done a slide on it. Uh, the NHSR community was set up a, about th three years ago now. And this is um, a community that's just trying to get everybody involved in, in the NHS, in, in R and kind of using it, getting people trained up. Um, in fact, their conference has um, just finished, I believe it was last week, um, where they had a whole series of talks. So if you go on to the uh, NHSR community website, um, there should be videos of all the sessions up there. Um, and yeah, they, they also have a Slack channel, which uh, you might want to join, um, where it's quite active, people posting lots of information and very much talking about uh, NHS related use of R. Um, so things like data sets, data crunching issues. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really helpful uh, community. So I'd encourage you to, to engage with that. In fact, I'll, um, let's have a little look at the NHSR community website, just uh, for a little plug here. So uh, this is the NHSR community website, and they've got um, lots of recordings of various different webinars that they've done up there. You've got the NHSR conference, the workshops and plenaries, they will be going up as um, uh, recorded sessions, I believe. Um, and in fact, I can send you invites to the NHSR uh, Slack community if you'd like that. Uh, I'll post a, um, I'll see if I can post a joining link uh, in the chat. Uh, over lunch. Okay, so the main way that we're going to interact with the uh, the R language uh, during today's training session is going to be via R Studio. Now I've got some slides on the uh, that, but actually it's just easier to look at the environment itself. So RStudio, whether you're opening it in RStudio Cloud or locally on your own machine, um, this is the view that you should see of RStudio. And we've got these kind of four main windows. Down here in the bottom left, we've got the console, which is a where all of your output comes out like in Python, you've got the Python IPython console, and that's where any errors, any error reporting comes up and it shows which lines of code that you've run. Um, and that's the same here. Above that, we've got the uh, script window. This is where you will, where we'll write our code and run it from here. Um, we can see that there's a run button up here. 
you can use that to either run the whole script or you can select sections of code and click click run and the shortcut is control enter for that that does vary on uh, mac i believe but if you hover over over it uh, it will tell you what the shortcut is up here in the on the right hand side is the um is the environment window and in here again like in um spider with python uh, this is where all of your variables will be displayed so you can easily see what variables you have active um, and then down here down in the bottom right um, we have our uh, kind of more uh, kind of output viewer and uh, useful bits window um, so we've got a plots window here and this is where any plots coming out will be displayed uh, there's an export button to easily be able to export your plots um, just without having to use any code uh, there's also a files tab here so that we can um, go in and access file particular files and there's a packages tab and we'll come on to uh, this a little bit more in a moment. So this layout should be pretty familiar because basically uh, Spider have, their latest version of Spider uh, is pretty much based on our studio. They've taken the idea of the plots window um, and also use the idea of the, the uh, variable environment. Um, so there's a lot of similarity and crossover in uh, the IDE design here. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, our studio looks pretty blank at the moment, but we'll fill it with some code shortly. Just gonna nip through these. So like in Spider uh, with Python, we have to uh, set our working directory in our studio. This lets uh, the um, lets the code know where we want it to be, where we want it to be saved to, but also where we want it to draw additional um, components from. Um, so if we have a data folder, where that data folder is located. So there's um, there's three different ways I counted this morning of setting your working directory in our, uh, in our studio. So one is to go up to the top here, go to tools, come down, go to global options. And then in global options, we can set our default working directory here. Quite often you want to be able to set your working directory more dynamically. So one way to do it from uh, kind of from, from the main front in um, our studio is to go to the files tab over here on the right hand side. And then we can go to uh, any of our, we can get set, select our folder so uh, in fact, I'm going to go and set mine to where I've got all the information for this. So uh, navigate into my training folder where I've got everything here and where the exercises are. And I'm going to set, this is my working directory. I can go to the more tab here at the top, set as working directory. And we can see down here in the console, down at the bottom, that it's come up with set WD and then the path to our working directory. So in terms of coding, 
at the start of our script, we can set our working directory using the command set WD and then the path to where our working directory is located. Um, so this is a nice, it, it gives, you, gives you options on how to set your working directory nice and easily, whether you want it done within the script or to do it just yourself manually. Okay. So um, packages, like in Python, we also use um, libraries to ex uh, and packages in this, as they call them in R. Uh, R. Um, we use these to extend the functionality of base R. So R comes with a load of uh, pre-built in functionality, but then so people have developed more um, more useful functions and extended the functionality of base R. And we do this, uh, we extend um, ours, our functionality in R by installing packages. And this is done by going up to the toolbar uh, or to the, um, to the packages tab and selecting to install packages. It's a very nice, simple uh, interface for this within our studio. So you have either packages here and we can go to install and then you start typing the package name. So for example, today we're going to use the psych package. And I've already got this installed on here, I believe. Um, and we can select install and that'll be installed down the bottom here. And we can see that being installed in the console. And hopefully my internet's not playing up. There we are. So that's finished installing now. Uh, we can also install packages from the toolbar in tools, install packages, and we get the same window to be able to install packages. You can install multiple packages by separating them with a uh, space or a comma. Okay. Uh, we can also install packages from the command line using the command install.packages and then inserting the package name. Okay, so um, just a couple of notes on our conventions that we'll see during today. So unlike Python, R does not require the use of correct indentations in the code. However, convention, programming convention dictates that standard indents are used. So when you're, um, uh, when you're doing a loop, uh, you write the first line of your for loop, and then normally what runs within that loop is indented. Um, our studio and most editors will automatically put that indent in there. If for some reason you don't have that indent there, the code will still run. Um, but the thing is to try and maintain the best practice, um, the best conventions, and to use the indents as you would normally in Python. So, um, when we're writing comments in, uh, in R, we use the hash symbol to insert a comment in the code. Uh, and one of, the, <laughs> one of the most confusing things about R is that R uses what are called assi uh, assignment operators. And normally in Python, your assignment operator, when you're assigning something to a variable is just an equals. In R, we use the arrow followed by a hyphen instead of using just an equals. 
the equals will work as this is, is the, it means the same, but in terms of our conventions, um, it's poor practice to use the equals and we should use the left facing arrow and a hyphen. Um, this is because you can assign things both ways in R and this one's the wrong way around. This arrow should be facing to the right, but we can assign things from, uh, from right to left and from left to right in R. Um, and we're not going to touch this on, on this today, but there's also global assignments that you can do using a double arrow. So we're going to see how all this works in, in practice um, by uh, doing some coding along um, and looking at the functionality. But yeah, if, if you have any questions at any point, do just let me know and uh, we, can, we can go back over things. Okay, so that's me done with the introduction. What we're now going to do is start writing our first R script. Yes, there's uh, no, um, no rest for the wicked with this one. This is straight in and I'd like you to, first of all, open, make sure you've got an instance of R Studio open with a, a new script open and you can open a new script up here in the top left of your window and the, the white paper with the green plus symbol is just what you, if you click that it'll open a, uh, a new fresh uh, R script for you. Okay, so we are going to start with basic functionality in R. So let's have a little think about uh, the, the place where we always have to start with programming languages is data types. When what we're writing and what um, types of information we get. Um, so first of all, we have exactly the same types of um, data as you do in Python. So a we can, uh, let's start with working with integers. So what I'd like you to do is type along with me and um, run the code as, as we go. So first of all, we're gonna create a variable called x and we're gonna use our assignment operator, which is the arrow, the left facing arrow followed by a hyphen and we're going to put C followed by one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, four. Now, this C operator, this means concatenation. Basically, what we're doing is we're creating a list like we do in Python. Um, whereas instead of using the word list, or anything, or um, using, uh, normally it will be square brackets um, in Python. Here we use the, we use C and then normal curved brackets and then separate what we want in our vector of information, which is one, two, three, four. And if I run that line, I can see that X turns up in my environment as a value. And this is a vector of numbers, one, two, three, four, of length one to four. Now, what you can see here is a major difference between Python and R. In R, we start counting at one. In Python and pretty much um, all other programming languages, you start counting at zero. Um, and this is something that Dan and, Dan and uh, 
everyone will drum into you in Python that we start counting at zero. In R, we start counting at one, just, just to confuse you a little bit more. So here we've got um, a vector of numbers, which are of length one to four. And where it's got, it uses the word number, num. This is the equivalent of an integer. It's exactly the same thing. So these are whole numbers. And we can check that by using the class function, which is class x. And this will tell, give us what the type is. And it's a numeric. So we can see that down in the console that this is popped up as being telling us that x is a numeric variable. OK, now we can do this for um, other types of uh, other types of variable as well. Um, so let's assign to y, let's use strings. For example, red, green, blue. And if I run Y, we can see that turn up here. And it says character in our environment, CHR. And if I run class Y, we can see that this is a character variable. And this is the equivalent of a string. I don't know why they choose to use different words. It's slightly confusing, but um, numeric is the equivalent of integers and characters are the equivalent of strings. Okay, now if we If we start um, looking at uh, other types of numbers, we also have um, double, which is where we have <clears throat> assigned to Z, 2.45, then this is also numerical. And if I do class Z, we also it also says that it's numeric. This isn't precisely true. Um, what they are is actually uh, double, which is a floating point number, which means that we have uh, decimal places. Um, and it's not an integer value. However, this is hidden from you in R, and you can't directly see that. Um, so just something to be aware of there. Um, integers and um, floating point numbers are separated in R, but it does it works in the background to um, work out the difference between them. So you can there's it, essentially when you're working with numbers for you, there will be no difference between an integer and a floating point number uh, with decimal places. Um, you don't actually have to worry about that, unlike you do in Python. Okay. So the, uh, the other um, type that we need to look at is we have um, categories in um, in Python and we also have categories in R but these are called factors and what we're going to do is change y to be a, as factor. So 
this is going to convert our strings red, green, blue into factors instead. So we can see now why in our environment is a factor, and this means with three levels, blue, green, and red. And they have, they've been given the numerical indices three, two, and one. And we can check that using the class call class Y, which shows us that it's a factor. Okay. And so the other data type that we've got used to using is booleans. And again, booleans, are, and they're actually, um, again, not called booleans in, um, in R, they're called logical variables. And so if I do, um, I do you and C do true, false, true, and run that. It's come up as a character variable, but if I convert you to as logical, now we can see you has changed in our environment to logi or logical. And we can do the same thing as class U. And it will show us that that's in our console, that that's a logical variable. OK. Now, one of the things that you'll have noticed there as I was typing the true and falses was that they are all, that true and false are fully capitalized. Um, Again, a slight difference to Python. In Python, you just capitalize the first letter, so the T or the F, and the rest is lowercase. In R, um, Booleans, logical um, variables need to be, um, or arguments need to be written as uh, in full capitals. And we, we will see some instances of that a bit later. Okay, so just to reiterate, like we have in Python, you have your numerical, your integers, and um, your floating point numbers. Uh, and you have your strings, which are called characters, characters in R. You have categories, which are called factors, and Boolean values, which are called logical factors. And we can check any variable, um, what its class is, either in the environment, we can see as that's flagged, or we can look uh, using the class function and using the, uh, the variable name as the input argument to that function. Okay. Any questions about that? No, we okay? Just say I, I can't see the chat or anything. So if uh, do do holler if there are any questions. Okay, moving on. Okay, the next thing that we need to know. Okay, we got some um, we got some variables and we can make them up of numbers and words um, and true or false statements, but how are they organized? So in the same way that we have in, in Python again, um, we have different ways of organizing our data. So just delete these bits. 
Okay. Sean, um, yes. Sorry, yes. sorry Sean, question just coming on the chat um, uh, about single or double quotes. Is this like Python that it doesn't matter and it's up to you, or is there a convention in R? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, one of the few similarities, it doesn't matter. You can use single or double quotes. Excellent. Thank you. That's not a problem. Okay, so data structures. Let's have a look at data structures. So, um, the most simple data structure, same way as Python, is that we can have um, a vector of information. So, what we're going to do is just use the, um, we're going to say A and assign to that the numbers one to five. And this syntax here, where I've put, written one colon five, means create a, num um, a vector of numbers from one to five. So we can see that. If, if we run that, it creates in, um, integers in this instance. And that's interesting that it's uh, saying int instead of um, number, as it doesn't normally do that. But uh, it might, uh, it's, it's making a distinction here um, that we've got integers um, and they are one, two, three, four, five. And when we have just a single um, vector, it's, it's a vector that we have here. It's just one single um, sequence of numbers or a sequence of inputs. And where we were creating our, um, where we were creating uh, our vectors using C, using the C operator, the concatenation operator, we can do the same thing using that. So just typing in a few different instances, fish, cat, dog with C, and that creates a character vector. So again, it's a vector. It's a single um, strip of information. Um, it, it's a one dimensional, um, it, it only has one dimension of information. Okay, so vectors um, can be extended and they're extended using the syntax of the variable name and then we say where in the vector do we want additional information added. So I'm going to say I want to put something in position six of the, uh, the variable A in position six. So we've only got, we've got five pieces of information. I want to add a sixth one. And I want to assign to that the number six. And when I run that, six is added to the vector A. And if we want to change an entry, we can say A and then use an existing position here, position four, and we can assign a new number there. So here we can see one, two, three, 11, five, six. We changed what was assigned to position four in our vector A. Okay, and so it's it's that simple with, with vectors that you simply on the left-hand side of your argument where you've got the variable that you're assigning something to, you state the position where you want it assigned to uh, in square brackets. So in that way, it's quite similar to um, to Python. It's sim similar-ish syntax. Okay, 
Now, one dimensional great data is great, but often we are using uh, multi dimensional data. And so these are called arrays. And you'll all be familiar with arrays by now. This is your general kind of uh, spreadsheet um, where you've got columns and rows. Um, and then you might have multiple spreadsheets, which is a third dimension to your data. Um, but we can create arrays very easily in R using, for example, I'm going to assign to X and I'm going to say array. I want to create an array. And R Studio is quite helpful as it's got, it uh, uh, suggests functions to you and then gives you um, the arguments for that function. So here we need to state what the data is that we want to turn into an array and what the dimensions are of that array, what shape we want it to take. So we're going to create an array and we're going to use the numbers 1 to 20. So again, using this the same syntax as we did up here at the top, um, creating a vector. We're going to say I want to create the numbers 1 to 20. And then we use the keyword argument dim to uh, give it the dimensions of the array. And we use dim equals. And here we're using the concatenation operator because we've got to give it two dimensions, basically. So when we give, because we're giving it two dimensions, we've got to make sure that they're stuck together. In Python, you'd normally use square brackets for this. Um, as that kind of in, uh, inserts it as a vector. Here we need to use, because we don't have that functionality in R, we need to use C. And we're saying, I want to pass in four and five. So what this means is that I want four rows and five columns. And I hope I've got that right way around. Yes. Um, that I want four rows and five columns. So it's rows first, columns second. Um, and again, that's the same as Python. It's always, if you're giving dimensions of an array, it is your rows first and your columns second. So if I run that, we now get an array um, X, which is, if we look up in our environment, we can see x, and this is an integer array, and it's of the dump. We've got one to four. We've got four columns. Uh, hang on. Yeah, no, four rows and five columns. And we can actually, well, you can't interrogate um, kind of a vector values in are in the uh, environment, we can click here on this little table over to the right and it will pop up. Um, again, very similar to spider, um, the array itself and show us what the array looks like. Here we can see we've got four, um, four rows and five columns. And these have the numbers one to 20 in them. And you'll see that it's organized them in terms of going down the columns instead of going across. Um, so we've got the numbers one, two, three, four in our first column, five, six, seven, eight in our second column. Now, Working with arrays is kind of the one of the main ways that we, uh, we work with data in well in, in both pro most programming languages, um, and ours no different. So we can create an array, but then we also want to be able to use parts of the array. So we can select components of that array by use by calling different commands. So what we can say is x and I want row one, 
column five. And if I run that, oh, sorry, elements, the element from row one, column five. And if we run that, it shows that it's got the value 17 in it. And we can go and check. And we can see that in row one, column five, we've got the value 17. And that's extracted that for us. If we want to extract an entire column, we can use a similar syntax, but in, instead of specifying the row that we want, we simply ignore that and put a comma that normally separates our rows from our columns. We just, we don't put any a row entry and we can say, that, for example, I want column one here. And down in the console, if I run that, you can see that you've got um, one, two, three, four, which are the values in column one. And now if I want to extract a row, you can see where this is going. We simply put the, very, uh, the array name and then four and a comma and leave the column call blank. And if I run that, we get 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, which are the contents of row 4. OK. Right. Uh, just wondering whether to do. Let's go straight to data frames. So what we can do is we can also create multi-dimensional arrays. Um, and this is you done using the matrix function. And this is in the r4healthcare.org um, materials. And basically you're um, just creating, uh, adding additional arrays um, to what, what you're doing. Um, and it shows you how to do that. Quite often, we're normally only working with two dimensional arrays at the moment. And in this introduction, I'll keep it reasonably simple. So, arrays are um, the equivalent to your NumPy um, arrays, really, and kind of base function, uh, base Python um, data structures. So, normally, um, you know, th this is where you're not really using column names or anything. It's just it's a um, a rectangle of data. Um, but pandas in Python enables you to use something called data frames, and they didn't come up with that by themselves. It actually came from R. One of the main data data structures that you use in R is data frames. And this allows you to work in a more spreadsheet like way by calling, assigning names to columns and calling them in a slightly different way. So I'm just going to clear my script here and clear my variables. So we're going to create our first data frame like a uh, pandas data frame, except from this, the original, the original and best R one. So data, we'll use data as our input, as our variable name, and then assign to data, we're gonna say as dot data dot frame, and we'll get the autocomplete there. And again, showing us the arguments that we need in that. So X is the data that we want to input as the data frame. And then we can also provide uh, row names if we wanted to. But here we're going to create a matrix. We're going to use a matrix as its input and it's going to be the numbers one to four. And 
this is going to be split by the number of rows two. So the matrix function works similarly to the array function. Um, it, they're just slightly different um, in that matrices, okay, I better get this the right way around. Matrices are, are, um, are just two dimensional, whereas arrays are three dimensional. Pretty sure I've got that the right way around. Um, matrix is two dimensional an array can be multi-dimensional. Um, so here we're just using a matrix, which is stating it's only two-dimensional, it's limited in that respect. Um, and we are using the numbers one to four, and we're going to split, split them between two rows. So if I run this function, we get the data, uh, data variable, and it shows that it's two observations of two variables. And if we now go in and look at this, we've got two columns and two rows. And what, where it says two observations of two variables, this is all about data orientation, that you always have observations as your rows and your variables are your columns. That's the way data should always be orientated, just so that because it's a, it's a convention that everybody then understands. So, yeah, that we can think of these like our uh, patients, our rows, and then different observations about them in our columns. So, that's the data frame um, uh, kind of uh, uh, the data frame type. And we can do lots of different things with our data frames. So let's create another data frame called A. And well, uh, sorry, let's create a matrix called A. Let's pre assign this first of all. So last time we did it within the data frame. Um, within the data frame itself, uh, the data frame function. This time we're going to pre-specify it. So the numbers one to six in two rows. Um, so that means, uh, yeah, so the numbers one to six spread across two rows. Then we're gonna create some names, uh, some column names. So we're gonna create a variable called names and we're going to assign to that three column names because we're going to have three columns. If we've got two rows in our matrix, uh, we're going to and we convert it to a data frame. We're then going to have uh, two rows and three columns. So uh, we need three names and they're going to be ID, height, And wait. So we've got three names there. Then what we're going to do is we're going to um, assign to data. And we're going to use the as data frame function and assign A to that. Then, in order to change the column names, because if, if we run, if I run this, so A is that matrix, got our names, create our data frame, and you can see that's just got V1, V2, V3 at the moment. We can then change the column names using col names on the left hand side here for data. So we're saying, I want to change the column names of the uh, data frame data. And we use, we're going to assign names, the names variable where we've got our ID, height, and weight names. So if I run that, 
and then go and open data and see that it's changed to ID, height, and weight. And we can then also convert um, data frames back into a matrix using the call as matrix. So we're going to say mat, I'll call this map data, and as matrix, I want to change data to a matrix. And this time, it gives me map data here, and it looks very similar. They are slightly different. You can perform different functions, and we'll see more of that as we go along. Uh, data frames, uh, you, there are some different ways that we can call data within a data frame. Right. OK. Any questions at the moment on uh, vectors, arrays, matrices, or data frames at all? No? OK. Right. So Sorry, now, Sean, I just clap. Yeah. So yeah. So um, on your row, on your row three, you've made a matrix of two rows with the numbers one to, to six, and yep. then row number four, you set the field names for that, haven't you? Yep. Like the ID, height, weight, and what's the what, what's the next row doing on number five? So number five, that is the creation of the data frame object. So we're using the call but as data really done frame. That in, in row three, it? No, no. So that's created a matrix here. So you can see that, again, in the same way that you're using uh, in Python, anything that comes before brackets is normally a function. So here we're using the matrix function to create a matrix of the numbers one to six with two rows. Whereas in line five, we're, use, um, we're converting the matrix A into a data frame. So it's changing its object type. Okay. Does I have interest. Why would you need to change it into a data frame and not leave it as a matrix? Uh, so that's what we will come on to that. Um, Okay. Data frames are easier to use in many ways. This is why you have the whole pandas library in Python, is that um, it means that uh, the columns, essentially it boils down to the way that you can use data in the columns, and you can call them by the column name more easily. They're, it's this kind of more flexible, there's more flexibility in the way that you can um, use the data within a um, within a data frame. It will assign it, it. They have they're a different object type. Um, they have more data embedded behind them, um, which yeah we'll see. They're easier to work with. Um, they have some predefined functions for subscript and subsetting them, um, different sort functions as well, just because of the way that the data is containerized. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to understand um, that when, when we're creating things like vectors, a vector is an object. Um, and that has different properties to what a matrix will have and what an array will have and what a data frame will have. Um, so different functionality will work on different objects in different ways and some won't work on certain objects. Um, with data frames, it's all to do with the way the metadata is used around column names um, uh, in order for mainly sorting, grouping, subsetting functions, which are easier to do with data frames than they are to do with matrices. 
Um, okay, and thank you. also in normally in a matrix um, or an array, all of your data has to be of the same type. So if, if we have a matrix, they all have to be numbers. In a data frame, we can have columns with different data types, you know, more like a spreadsheet. Um, a spreadsheet essentially is a data frame. Each column can contain a different data type. But if they all had to be the same data type, they all had to be strings or they all had to be numbers, that would be an array or a matrix. Yeah, thank you. No problem. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an important point that, and it's kind of, it's one of those where kind of go through these different objects is because it, it, yeah, you do need to know that they are different and that, um, and how to convert between them. Okay, right. We will move on and we will just look at a couple of, um, nice little functions for um, things that, again, we do quite often in Python. You kind of tend to do a lot in um, uh, in uh, data engineering um, is creating sequences and um, replicating numbers. So sequences are really useful um, because quite often we want to create new columns of numbers, um, whether it's creating some IDs um, to add to uh, an existing data frame or um, replicating uh, numbers to do random assignments of categories or you know, there's, there's all sorts of things. But, Creating um, sequences and replicating numbers is uh, something we do a lot. So uh, R is very much set up for this because it's it's all about doing these these quite nice simple um, manipulations of, of data. And so we're going to assign to X, um, and we're going to create a sequence, and we use the function. SEQ seek and you can see there's different versions of this um, generate regular sequences and things um, but yeah we're going to create um, just a sequence of numbers and the arguments that we need to put into this are the beginning of our sequence the end of our sequence and the in increment so for example, we can, we're going to start at one, we can end at 10, and we're going to do it in steps of two. So this should produce us five values um, going from one to 10 in steps of two. If we run that, you can see we get one, three, five, seven, and nine assigned to X. So nice, simple little uh, function, but very useful. And within that, you can also use, um, so for your step, it could be a logarithmic progression, it could be squares, square numbers, um, square roots, anything like that. So you can um, write a mathematical uh, formula for the um, step progression instead of just using a standard whole number. So if we want to replicate something, a lot of times we can use an assign to y and we use rep. So you can see they were really original in um, all shorthand here for um, names in terms of function names. So seek rep. Um, and when we're doing replication, we say what we want to replicate and how many times. So we're going to replicate the number three and replicate it five times. And again, these are these are base R um, functions. 
is uh, you can always have a quick Google, uh, just R replicate. And just in case you can't remember the order of the arguments or what the arguments are. And there's always R for healthcare, which has all of, the, all of this written down for you. So Y and uh, if we run that line and we get Y uh, and five threes, nice and easy. Um, we can also do this for um, Boolean values as well, which is often handy. Um, so we uh, let's assign to Z, we're going to replicate um, and we're going to do through and we're going to replicate that five times. We can see we've got five trues there. Okay, so that's just a couple of handy, handy functions there for you. Sorry, Sean, just a quick question. So uh, would it be the case that you're, so you've said on that last one that you, if you wanted it for Boolean values that you would, um, you would do that, but it, it, what it's actually done is five strings. Um, would, would oh, you... sorry, yeah. Sorry, it is five character values. That's, okay. uh, yeah, you'd need to transform to logical. There. So without the inverted commas, I think well, that, that, that will give it, won't it? If, if that would then be five Boolean values. Look of it as... Seems to work. Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it will. Yes, yeah, good point. That's uh, excellent. So, yeah, if you just leave off the um, uh, the quotation marks, yeah. you'll, uh, uh, you can just do it as Boolean values. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Now... One last, I think we'll just, we'll do one last bit and then we'll have a little break for, for 10 minutes. Um, we're going, so I mentioned before that R is useful for, um, it's one of its powers, <laughs> one of its superpowers is that it's extremely fast at doing um, matrix calculations. And this is because it doesn't require any special um, uh, notation to um, perform calculations on every element within a matrix. That's what it's automatically doing. It's, it's used to, uh, it was designed to, if you're going to make a transformation, you make a transformation across an entire matrix. Uh, with your data. So let's just have a little look at this um, in a little bit more detail. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start by creating um, two matrices. We're going to do matrix A and this will be use the function matrix and we're going to use the numbers one to four in two rows um, and with two columns, oh, number and two columns. And then we're going to create another matrix B. We use the function matrix. And here we're going to do a sequence from five to eight. And if you notice, I haven't put in an increment in the sequence um, because the default is one. So I'm just going to use the default value. And we'll do that to organize that as two rows and two columns. What you'll also notice is that I added the encol argument here. Um, you can either specify the number of rows or the number of columns in the matrix, or you can do both. Um, given the shape of the data here, um, it's you, you only need to specify one or other, but this is just to demonstrate that you can do both or either. So, oh, just delete my 
old ones. There we go. So A, um, create our matrix A and B. So we've got one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. And now we can do things with our matrix, uh, with our two matrices, with our two matrices. We can add them together. We can do A plus B. And if I run that, you'll see down in the in your console, you get six, 10, eight, and 12. So what it's done is it's done element-wise addition of the matrix. So the value, which is in row one, column one of matrix A is added to the value, which is in row A in matrix B, row one, column one. And it does that all the way around. So we've added together one and five, two and six, uh, three and seven, and four and eight. Um, and likewise, if we do um, A minus B, we get the same. And actually, uh, it's a nice one that uh, you get all minus fours in that instance, but it's exactly the same principle. And that works with um, Yeah, the, uh, this works with uh, multiplication and um, division as well. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any need to, to demonstrate that. So the other thing that we can do, which is Andy, I, I wish Andy was here because he, he wrote this bit and uh, it's, it's uh, the more complex version of matrix multiplication. Um, we can use a different construction, which is a percentage sign star percentage sign B. And what this means that, so when we multiply matrices using matrix multiplication, the multiplication of a times B is not the same normally as B times A. It's it's not associated uh, associative. Um, this is something that um, that I need to read up on. <laughs> but th this is when you're uh, this is full um, matrix multiplication where. Um, each element is multiplied by every other element as well, or I believe. Um, basically, you can do complex uh, matrix multiplication, but I wouldn't worry about that. We'll leave that for now, um, as I need Andy here to explain the ins and outs of that. <laughs> um, right, moving on. Okay, before we do have a break, sorry, that was a bit of a tease. We'll do unique values quickly, just because that's um, an easy little function. Sean, um, sorry, can I, yeah. can I just ask, uh, just before you move on from that, so um, can you do uh, natively dot product uh, calculations in in R? Um, because obviously it's, it's halfway there in terms of the multiplying each element by each other. Um, uh, but can you, can you, um, well, I guess that I guess that is it. Isn't it? Uh, sorry, yeah, that's that's the um, the this more complex form. Um, oh, I okay. think that's dot product. Yeah, yeah. I I, I I kind of shouldn't have mentioned it because I don't understand enough about <laughs> it. I'll, I'll hold my hands up there. <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, yeah, I'll need to get Andy to explain that. Um, in fact, I might get him to do a little video on um, matrix multiplication cool. in R yeah. and dot product because, um, yeah, it would be useful to to understand, especially for me. Um, <laughs> um, right. 
we'll just quickly, yeah, unique values, always handy to be able to get unique values out of your data. Um, and R makes this very easy. Um, we can just create, uh, we'll just create some data. Um, so we'll do some, some random, some, a whole set of numbers. And then we can assign to another variable our unique values. And we'll do unique of our uh, numbers uh, stored in X. And here we get in Y, we get our list of unique numbers there. So nice and easy, that's simply unique. That's it, that's uh, the only call that you need to make. Um, okay. Right, I think we'll just take a little bit of a, just a quick uh, 10 minute break until 11 o'clock, um, just for a bit of a comfort break and just to uh, rest the old eyes. And we'll come back and we will look at, uh, we're going to go on to string concatenation and we'll look at if statements in R, just looking at syntax, reading from and writing to files, uh, and yeah, subscript and subsetting, um, and a bit more of kind of the data engineering side of things. Um, yeah. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for your attention and see you at uh, 11. Don't don't leave the meeting. Just uh, leave your camera and uh, off and uh, your mic mute, muted. But we will be back at exactly 11 o'clock. Thank you. Hey, can everyone now see my screen? Sean, can you see my screen? Yep. Just X out. OK, this is me very quickly just getting something on the screen so I can try and show you what, what I think is happening. So I just played in R to see what the result was doing those different um, calculations that Sean showed us. So, so here, I believe that yeah, A times B will give the same result as B times A. So just say up here, I've just quickly handwritten out our matrix A and our matrix B, just so I can refer to them to show what's happening. So if we do A times B or B times A, it's doing like element wise or position wise um, multiplication. So you're just taking the same position. So it'll be one times five will then be in our resultant position one. Our position over here will then take three times seven. Position here will take our two times six and here will be the four times eight. So that's the um, easy version. So the next one Sean showed us with these um, percent signs around the um, asterisk. So this is doing matrix multiplication and this does not give the same result as if you do A, B or B, A. It will be a different um, result. So hopefully I can try and explain this <laughs> correctly. So in order to do um, matrix multiplication, so it's a, you need to have in your matrix a, so your first position one, you need to have the same number of columns in A as the same number of rows in B. So, um, so this works because we have um, like a square matrix two, two, so it's the same in all dimensions. Um, so over here, I've got another example. So you could also do it here because if this is our first um, matrix. Here we have three um, columns in A. So we have two columns in A, and then we have two rows in B. So you can do a multiplication over here on these as well because we've got two and two. Whereas if we had then a, another value here, you wouldn't be able to do it because here you've got two with three. And I'll hopefully next will show you why that is why you need to have those um, matching number of elements in those dimensions. So to do A percent star percent B for position one here, um, in the first position, you're you're doing essentially you're taking this and doing um, yeah like your dot product then of with these values here. So whichever position you're in, you take so you're in row one, 
So you take the values in row one of A and you're in column one. So you take the columns of B. So you do one times five plus three times six. So when you move over here, you're in row one still. So you're still using row one of A, but you're in column two. So you're taking column two of B. So you're now taking one times seven plus three times eight. And that gives you that value there. So when you move down here, you're now in column two. So you move to your column two values of matrix A, but you're now in row one. So you take row one of B. So that's why you get your two times five, four times six. And then finally over here, two times seven, four times eight, which is why you need to have those matching um, numbers in each dimension. So if you switch it around and now we do B times A, now you'll be taking five, seven, with your two one, because you'd then be doing your five times one plus seven times two, which is why you'd get a different value if you do a um, percent star percent B or B A. Is that enough or just a very quick explanation of, um, yeah, thanks, thanks, what Kate. it's kind of doing? <laughs> that I just, just to say, I've just found also, Alex, so that's, um, uh, so I had to remind myself of this as well. I've just posted a link in the chat, um, which is uh, this explained for what appears to be four-year-olds, uh, <laughs> but that's exactly my level. Uh, so, um, so yeah, exactly that. So it's worth checking that out. And that, uh, that strictly speaking, it's all coming flooding back to me now from my computer science. This is what you're supposed to do when you multiply one matrix by another. So this is true matrix multiplication, which is using, as you say, dot product. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a bit weird to get your head around, um, but uh, exactly that. And the, the link there shows it in, in nice, you know, uh, primary school uh, <laughs> instructions as well. <laughs> Great, I'll stop really sharing. Helpful. No, thank you both. That's, uh, that's really helpful because uh, it is something that's worth trying to get your head around and I keep meaning to get my head around it. That's, uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, powerful way to to be able to multiply matrices together and, in, and fast in R as well. Um, Go on, Richard. Yes. Here. Um, just what's what might be a real world application for doing this? That's a very good question, Richard, and I'm going to have to find some for you. That's because <laughs> uh, that's you... that's what I struggle with. That's uh, so you might, so uh, actually I just looked on, on the link and there's uh, an example of um, why you would want to do that. But it's essentially, do you remember when we talked in the Python session about dot product and we said about uh, using it as weighting? Uh, so you might have um, a weighting calculation that you need to make to weight certain values. Um, so it might be that you're, um, you want to weight, for example, travel times by a certain number of people that are coming from a particular location. Uh, so when you multiply, you might have one matrix that represents the travel times and one matrix that represents the um, number of people. Um, and you can then wait so that the, uh, in your calculation, if you've, you've, if you've got a very long travel time, but only very few people coming from that area, you don't want that to feature so strongly. Um, uh, but if you look at the link, there's a, they use the example of, um, uh, costs of apple, cherry, and blueberry pies, um, and uh, um, by day of week, um, uh, to show you how that sort of it, it, it's that exactly that it's, it's a weighting calculation that you're making. Yeah, I'll try and actually put together a, a, a bit more of a use scenario and try and come up with something a bit more healthcare orientated as well. That's uh, that I believe be quite useful. I believe when Mike, I don't know if he'll cover this, but when he goes into the AI stuff. Uh, in machine learning, um, machine learning uses some of this as well right. in terms of waiting um, uh, because your neural networks are essentially doing this kind of stuff in the background as well. Yeah. No, great. Thanks, guys. But, yeah, it is one of those. It is important. It is useful to know how to do it. Um, but yeah, um, hope more to come on on that. Okay, let's um, let's get back and we'll go for some. Um, slightly easier um, to get our head around stuff here. Um, so we're going to have a look at, uh, what are we doing next? We'll have a quick look at array sizes. Um, so 
in Python, we use um, the uh, the len uh, function to be able to get the uh, the size of a um, a column or a vector of information. In R, we can do exactly the same uh, as as yeah, knowing the shape and size of your data um, and being able to uh, put that into a variable to be able to use it. So like going through loops. Um, yeah, this is a, a useful thing to be able to do. So what we're going to do, we just create a quick vector of information, of data. Um, so assigning to V the numbers 1 to 41. And so we've got a vector of length 41. And but we want to be able to know that and use that uh, vector length. So we can call length on a vector. And that'll give us, it tells us it's 41 down here in the console. So we can assign that. So for example, I can assign that to A. And that means that I know that there is, it's, it's 41. Um, in matrices, if we can do something similar, but we've got two dimensions to our matrix. So let's create a matrix M of the numbers one to nine and with three rows. So three rows and three columns. Then we can use the commands um, Let's assign these. Let's do n. We do m row. N row. And that gives us the number of rows, which is three. And we can do similarly n col is the number of columns. And that gives us three, which is the number of columns. Okay, so again, if you're wanting to um, get just the numbers of columns and the number of rows, that's that's how you do that. But perhaps we just want to check our dimensions in general. We can use dim m, and this will tell us that it's three by three, and this creates a vector d. So we can extract the columns and the rows from this. So if I just go down here to my console, I'm going to go D and one, and it gives me a three because that's what's in position one in the vector D. And likewise, if I put two, it would also give me three. Um, okay. So that's basically sizing. It's you use either length for a single vector of information. You use number of rows and number of columns to individually get those, whether it's a, um, a data frame, a matrix, or an array. And DIM gives you both the num uh, all of the dimensions uh, so the number of columns and the number of rows. And if you have multi-dimensional matrices, it will also give you those dimensions as well. So if you have a third dimension to it, uh, the dim call will give you those further dimensions as well. Okay. So one of the other things that we work with quite a lot is string information. So string data with um, categories, you know, there's often so much categorical data that we work with in, um, in healthcare. And it's useful to know how to manipulate strings. And again, ours surprisingly good at this. Um, and it's relatively simple to, to work with uh, string data. 
So let's create a, a couple of strings. Uh, so assigning to x um, the string, I'm going to call this one string, and assigning to y two strings. And what I can do is put, uh, so concatenating strings, if I want to merge those strings together, I can, let's create a new variable and we're going to just use paste x, y. And when I run that, oh, no, because I haven't run x and y, that's why. So one string, two strings, one string, two strings, and said basically you just paste them together while also separating it defaults to separation with a space. You can override that by using the separator argument set equals. Okay, so um, if we want to um, split a string, because that's, again, uh, splitting out words, um, like Dan will show you uh, more of this in, in Python um, for natural language processing, where you need to be able to split sentences apart into their constituent words. Um, R, likewise, again, you can do machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing and all sorts in, um, in R, should you be so inclined. Um, so it's useful to be able to know how to do these things and also just splitting up, um, working the strings in, in general when you're working with your data. So let's uh, now split our string apart and call this split. And we're going to use the function string split. And we can see here that we've got our, uh, we need to give it the data that we're going to split, which is x, and the split. Where do we want to split the data? So here we're going to, we're going to split uh, z, and we're going to split it at the spaces. So we need to tell it that we want to split at a space. So we put our split in um, inverted commas. So when we run that split, we get a list out. And our list, when we look at it, is one string, two strings. It's of length four. And we get these four individual the four individual words out. So just two simple um, kind of string manipulation functions there, and there's, there's a whole load more, but to be able to uh, bring your strings together and to be able to split them back apart again. Okay. Now, moving on to um, looking at uh, if statements um, and relational and logical operators. Um, so this is a bit more onto where these are the kind of things that we start building our programs out of. And in exactly the same way as in Python, we use all of the same um, logical and um, uh, relational operators. So let's start by creating some, some uh, data first of all. So we'll create A and let's uh, do two, eight and four. And we'll create another vector of information of data uh, called uh, 
called B, and that'll be 4, 9, and 2. And third one, C. And this one is going to be 3, 5, 7, 3, 2, 6. So basically we've got three vectors of, inform of data here, A, B, and C. A has three values, B has three values, and C has six values. And just run those. Okay, so we can use our, um, our relational operators to be able to look at and compare between these vectors of information. So let's do A is greater than B. So what we're asking here is that where is A greater than B? So if I run this, we get down in the console, you'll see false, false, true. And if we look back at our data, we can see that um, A is not greater than four. Uh, sorry, two is not greater than four. Eight is not greater than nine, but four is greater than two. So this is um, element-wise comparison of uh, our values in our vectors of, information, of data. Um, likewise, we use, um, if we're looking at not equal to, um, we get, we do, where, where is B not equal to A? And this is the same syntax as you see in Python, which is an exclamation mark followed by an equals, and that means not equal to. And so at no point in those vectors are the two element-wise, uh, are they equal element-wise. Okay, now if we're using, um, if we're comparing A and C, this is possible to do because C is a multiple of A. So if I do A is less than or equal to C, what it's going to do, and I run that, what it's done is it's looped through C twice. So it's compared 2 and 3, 8 and 5, 4, and seven. It's then compared two with three, eight with two, and four with six. Um, so it's looped through C twice, comparing it with A because they are because um, uh, C is a multiple of A, and it can iterate through that twice. If I were to remove Uh, an element from um, C. Let's see if this does work. It's no longer a multiple and we can't um, compare the two. So just in terms of logical comparisons that you can have um, element-wise comparison like this is uh, possible, but uh, the vectors that you're comparing either need to be of the same length or a one is a multiple of the other. Sean, when you compare those vectors, does it just work in the columns? Just go, does it stick in a column? Or will it compare so any number is, from any column? These are vectors. Um, so there's no distinction such as rows or columns in vectors. Um, they are elements. So this is just position one, two, three. And it's just element wise comparing element one with element one, element two with element two, and element three with element three. 
um, you would you would normally you could do do this with a matrix as well, and it, that would work. But it would be this element-wise comparison that would be done. So it's it's always the same position in the vector is being compared to the same position or the multiple of because they're just a sing they're just a single vector of inf of data. There's no no rows or columns. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, just just getting used to the different data types is uh, is, is yeah. So Sean, how do, how do you get it to pick up that you've taken that number out when you took the 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 sixth number out? Uh, I just reran it, so I just ran that line again. Do you run that line and then you run the line seven as well? And then right, if you okay. run line seven, then you'll get the warning message come up. Thank you. <laughs> it's noticing all those little nuances when you're doing it sorry, on a tiny yes. screen so quickly. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, no, sorry. I'm trying trying to explain as I go along. That's. Uh, um, uh, let's just see. I'll just uh, zoom in a little bit. That's any better. Thank you. That's much better. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so we often use um, these uh, relational operators. Um, when we're creating if statements, that's, that's where they're most commonly, um, or uh, they're quite commonly used there. So what we can do is let's uh, look at writing our first if statement in R because the syntax is slightly different to Python. Not hugely different, but it is slightly different. Um, so I... I'm going to create a variable x and assign the value of three to it. I'm then going to create variable y and assign the value five to it. And our, in some ways, the um, the syntax is basically the same as Python, but uh, yeah, just slightly different for the if statement. So we just use as normal. We start with the word if and then a space. And then we use curved brackets and we say we give our um, what we want to compare, um, what our relation uh, relational check is going to be for our if statement. So if x is less than y, then we use curly brackets. And this is how we start what we're going to contain within our if statement. And kind of normal convention dictates that your if statement then starts on the next line and it will automatically in reduce a little indent. Um, and we can then say what we want to happen, what operation we want to happen if that um, relational comparison is found to be true. So then we're going to say I want to assign to z x minus y, for example. OK, so that's the basic if statement there. So if and then we have just curved brackets, a relational statement that we want to check in the brackets. Then we do curly braces and we write what we want the operation, to, what operation we want to be performed if our relational statement is found to be true. Okay. And then we can also, in the same way that we do with Python, we can do um, an else statement 
and we can say else curly brackets will do x plus y. So that covers anything, anything else. And that's it. It's just that instead of using a colon as you would in Python, we use curly brackets here um, to contain our operation. So I can run that and we'll see that in this instance, x is less than y. And so it performs this first operation. OK. Um, the other um, if statement that's useful to know is the if uh, else if statement. So I'm just going to copy this. And we can do um, if, no. uh, sorry, I've just forgotten this. It is ah, okay, that's it. Sorry, <laughs> just forgetting. I haven't worked with R in a little while, so to apologize, I do apologize. So if we want to do another if statement um, to cover another logical condition, we can say else if. And it's just that um, the else and the if are separated by a space, um, which in terms of syn program programmatic syntax kind of doesn't quite make sense. but. Um, um, it's just remembering that there needs to be a space between else and if. And then we check our next condition. So for example, um, x is uh, equal to y. And then in the curly brackets, our operation that we want performed if our condition is true. Okay. So the in as well as um, as long as as uh, sorry as well as uh, relational operators, we have logical operators as well, which are used in, um, in if statements. So uh, this is where we can do things like and, and uh, or, or not. Um, and for these, we use, again, um, the same as Python, we use the ampersand and we use the um, straight vertical lines um, as our logical operators. So most of the time we use a double ampersand or a double vertical line um, and this is because, uh, so that is um, just your standard comparison, that you're comparing two values and um, then checking the outcome. Sean, sorry, just a, just a minor correction. Uh, the uh, ampersand uh, operator and the straight line, they're not actually used in Python now. Uh, just to just to correct. So they, they oh, use, they're not. Uh, ah, right. No, yes. You, okay. You, and Thank you. All the words in Python, just in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> <laughs> no, you use your actual words in in yes. Python. That's uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so to bring up an example,
So just to show an example of this being done. So we have if y is greater than x and x is greater than z, then we want to then we can print some output saying z is lowest and y is highest. Um, uh, and then with different else statements here, and we can compare multiple conditions within a single if statement. Um, so that's how, um, how you use those kind of logical operators. Um, so th those are your ands. And if, if you want to just do or, it's just replacing the and with an or. Could you paste that section into, into the chat bit, please, Sean? Yep. Uh, hopefully, it's not easy for me to see the chat, actually. Uh, there we go. Cool. So again, all of this is on um, alphahealthcare.org. You know, I'm, I'm taking the examples directly from that. So they'll be familiar to you when you look back over the content and you're using, if you're using that um, to help you re uh, remember what, what you're doing. So again, you know, uh, these are all concepts that you should be familiar with by now with Python um, that we're doing uh, relational and logical comparisons within if statements, multiple comparisons using the else if um, statement and else to capture anything else. Okay. So skipping on quickly. I did promise a bit of a, um, a crash course in R today. We've only got one day and uh, this is this to give you all the basics. So it, uh, apologies for the swift pace um, that we're going through bits here, but it's just trying to cover everything for a bit of everything for you. Because a lot of it, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, given the basis that you've been given with uh, Python, this all should be very familiar concepts. It's just getting used to the uh, slightly different syntax, really. Um, and again, another uh, thing that is kind of similar um, to Python is uh, reading and writing to and from files. So um, I am just going to send you a if I was going to send you a data set. Um, helps if, where is that? Sorry, just gonna find my, that's where it is. Um, be able to do this. Right. So uh, in Slack, I am just sending over a data set to you. If you've pulled down the, no, you want to pull down the GitLab repository for this. So I just sent over a CSV file on Slack, which um, Sean, we're sorry, going you, to. You've put that in the mental oh, staff. I'm sorry, I have, haven't I? I'm not paying attention, am I? That's, uh, <laughs> OK, right. In the. Um, <laughs> Now in the module page in uh, module channel in Slack, there is a CSV file, which if you download and put into your working directory, we will write, uh, read in to our, um, 
uh, into R. Just give you a moment to do that. Okay, so I'm just going to um, show you. It's very simple. The um, I, I highly recommend again only using um, CSV files to bring uh, to import and export your data, um, just because R doesn't particularly like heavily formatted um, Excel files. Um, you can do Excel read-ins and from SPSS, SAS and Stata. Uh, I don't recommend it, just use CSV files. Um, those, those are the, um, the easiest way to move data in and out of, in and out of bar. Sean, um, apologies, we've had a question on the chat. Um, yep. For those of them using cloud, uh, yep. is, is, in terms of sort of their working directory, does that need to be set up a little bit differently? No, it's exactly the same. Exactly oh, okay. the same right. process. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so reading data in is very, very simple. It's um, simply say what we want to assign, the variable that we want to assign our data to. And then we use the read dot CSV command. And then all we have to do is say, where our data is. And in this instance, um, I got, where have I gone? I've gone to, I actually need to change my working directory as I know that mine, I'm in the wrong place. So, just go to here. And so we're just doing um, we just then need to just put in the file name ghq.csv within uh, inverted commas or quotation marks. And when we run that, the data is read straight in. And we can look at it by selecting the little table on the right hand side. <clears throat> So we can see that this is just, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the data set now, GHQ stands for. Um, this is just individual people um, sampled. Uh, oh no, not individual people. They are instances of something. Right. Um, but basically, one of the important things with um, the read.csv is that it automatically imports your data as a uh, data frame. So um, it, it it's, makes it very easy, um, but you have to know that your data is being directly read in as a data frame, like we do with um, pandas. Uh, read CSV and it reads it in as a pandas data frame. It's exactly the same process. 
So quite often you'll want your data as a data frame. It's got your maintains your column headers and um, you can get started straight away with this in that format. Now, um, when we want to write data out, it's very similar. We use the write dot csv command and we just uh, we say the variable that we want to write out which in this instance is ghq here and the name the file name that we want to write it out to so i'm going to call it ghq2.csv and it's important that you put the file extension on .csv because it won't um, automatically add that. Um, so we give the full file name that it's being written out to. And I can sure. see now that that's appeared here in my additional data file. Sean, can you yes. hold on a second? Um, for people on cloud, you have to do something slightly different um, to upload the GHQ file. So can I just talk you through it? I can't like remember it from something a long time ago. Um, in, in the bottom right hand pane, um, if you go onto the files tab, you've got upload. So if you've downloaded the yep. file, click on upload, browse to where you've saved it, it might still be in your downloads, then click on upload and you've got it in there and then you can follow Sean's, the rest of Sean's lecture. Sorry, Heather, where's upload? So, so the bottom right hand pane, um, so click on the files files tab, oh, files and, tab. and you've, right. you've got something there that's called upload if you click on that you can then browse and find the file because we have problems changing our default directory sean right okay oh is it not mm. automatically picked up on your file structure i i, I couldn't yes. i couldn't change it <laughs> but no. i remembered the upload thing from something a long time ago you can just that's choose so the directory that you're working with okay and then browse, is it? So you do upload, choose file, sorry, yeah? Right, yes. Yeah. Yay! Thank okay. you, Heather. Right. Okay, so um, yeah, reading and writing is simply read CSV and give the file name of the file that you want to um, read in. Uh, if if it's in a different location to your working directory, you simply add the path to that file uh, in front of it. And then to write out a CSV, you just use write.csv, giving the, uh, the object that you want to be written out and the file name that you want uh, attributed to it. Okay, so we are going to look at um, subscripting, sub, uh, subscripting and subsetting data next. And so this is where we're looking at taking taking a bit of data and then um, split it up in some particular way. So um, let's start first of all by creating some data. So to X, we're gonna assign sequence one to 10 in steps of 0.5. Okay. So here we can see that we've got um, 19 values uh, in steps of 0.5. And if we want to, if you remember, if we want to select an individual 
uh, element within that vector, we can select it by our, uh, using square brackets and saying which element we would like to select. So here we'll take the second element and that is 1.5. Okay, if we want to select more than one element, um, we can do so by uh, simply use within the uh, square brackets, use the C, the concatenation operator to define two uh, elements that we want to extract. So we can say, for example, four and seven, just separating them with a comma in there and that will extract both elements for us from a vector. Okay. Um, sorry, just... Uh, find so for if we're looking at um, subscripting um, subscripting uh, matrix or uh, an array then we can similarly do that um, as uh, if you remember um, so let's just create a quick matrix. So Z and I'm going to create a met matrix with a series of values in it. Let's just see how many I've got here. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay. And if I say I want uh, three rows, got twelve values, got three rows, and that's four columns. And I'm going to say by row equals true. And if I create Z, you can look at that. And, and what you'll see this time is that because I've added the by row argument to the matrix creation, instead of it defaulting to putting the data, uh, inputting the data into the matrix column wise, it's now doing it by row across, by row. Row one, inputting each element um, and then going down to row two and doing it like that. Um, so that's how you can change the orientation of uh, when you create a matrix. You need to use the by row argument. Okay, so if we remember from last time, uh, when we're subsetting a matrix, we say, okay, I want to subset Z, and I want row two, and in the square brackets, we give either, we can say two, four, so that's row two, column four, and that will give, give us a single element which in this instance is value 63. Or we can select an entire row by simply leaving out the column um, value. And that'll give us all the values in row two. Or we can use, um, we can select an entire uh, column by leaving out the row value. And so we can get all of uh, column 
3, for example. Okay. So that we've looked at previously, subsetting vectors and uh, rows, uh, subsetting vectors and arrays. Um, now we're going to look at data frames, which are a bit different. So what we're going to do is we're going to transform Z into a data frame. So let's call this data. I know some of you dislike that variable name, but I quite like it. So we, I'm going to call it data and as dot data dot frame. And we'll call that. And we're going to transform Z into a data frame and assign it to data. So we can see that we get three observations of four variables across there. Now, if we want to select a column from a data frame, we can, I'm going to assign to D1, I, I, want, to, I want to get this first column and assign it to D1. So what I can do is I say data, which is our data frame variable. And I use the, um, the dollar sign. And you can see that it's popped up with the column names of the data, uh, data frame data. So I can just select one of them, or I could type it in. And the dollar sign says, I want to take uh, column V1 of the data frame data. And this is kind of the shorthand to avoid having to use numerical indices within um, when working with data frames, one of the benefits of them. Uh, and it's the same as using the column name in square brackets in Python. Oh, I better create the data frame first. That's always a good idea. And what we get then is D1, and that's a numerical vector. So that's just, it's not been preserved as a data frame. It's simply a numerical vector when we've extracted that. Okay. There is uh, an interesting function in, um, in R um, because it's designed around this concept of data frames, uh, very much so. And what you can do is you can attach a data frame to avoid having to use the dollar sign notation. Um, so what we can do is use the command attach and we'll attach data. So we're attaching the data frame and what R can do is store a single data frame's name in its memory uh, to prevent you having to write data dollar sign and then the column every single time. Um, so if I attach data and then create do D2, um, and then I can just type V2. So I want to get column two and assign it to V2. But I haven't used the data frame name or the dollar um, notation. So if I run that now, it will extract column two and assign it to V2. Because R can only store one data frame's name at a time. Um, you need to, uh, if you want to change data frame that you're storing um, as your working data frame, you use the command detach. And detach and the data frame name. And then that will remove it from ours memory. Sean? Yes. 
when you're um, using that that second uh, that notation D two assign D two to V two, is there any way of invoking IntelliSense to get the column names from that? No, no, it doesn't. If you doesn't, had uh, column, if you wanted to pick column Fred Blond, yeah. yeah. You'd have to say you have to know your column names basically using that. Um, it might come up with longer column names if you start typing. Um, oh, auto complete. It might do auto complete, but I get the feeling it doesn't. No. No. Um, but yeah, but it might do. And once you've written it once, it should come up as an auto complete then afterwards. Okay. Just say, Sean, um, I, I've yeah. just tried it. If you um, if you start typing the first letter, if you push tab, uh, it will give you options, including the column names, if it's attached. Um, so you can you can do that. It will give it. Oh yeah. right. Oh, that's excellent then. That's uh, that's handy. Yeah, it does help when you've got long column names. But also, good practice is not to have long column names either. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we can attach, uh, we can do multiple column names as well. So um, let's do, um, let's call it D3. And what we're going to do is we're going to take from data and we're going to subset data for columns two and three. And we do this by, again, using the concatenation. Um, so we're creating a, a vector of um, column names. So we're going to attach V2, column V2, and we're going to attach column V3. Now, there is no dollar sign required here because this is essentially the subset syntax for data frames. Um, and it recognizes that what you're placing within this list is uh, the column names of this data frame. So the syntax is simply the, the data frame, square brackets, and then the list of column names that you want to subset for. So if I run that, you can see we get D3. And this time it's preserved as a data frame. Whereas when we extracted only a single column, it became a vector and was not a data frame object. It is now, if we extract two um, columns using this syntax, we get a data frame out instead. Okay, um, we can also subset using rows. And so when we do this, do D4 and assign to that, what we want to take is rows one and two. So we do data and we use square brackets again, but this time because our um, rows are numerically indexed, we use numbers and we can say one to two. And when we run that, so D4 becomes the first two rows that extracts the first two rows of our data frame data. Um, this is a very, very malleable um, syntax for subsetting. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll see in a moment how we can use this with conditional operations. Um, I'm no, no, I'm not going to show you that. There is a subset command which is just not worth using because it only works in certain circumstances, and you're better off just subsetting using um, uh, using this syntax here. Um, and my notes have gone funny as well. Okay. If we want to use uh, subset conditionally, so 
we want to select particular bits of data um, based on conditional um, or logical values. Um, what we can do is use this particular syntax. So I'm going to call D5. And what we do again, we give the data frame that we're going to extract the data from. Then we use square brackets. Now, weirdly, the convention is to put a space here. I'm not entirely sure why. I'm sure there probably is an explanation, but the convention is to put a space. And we use the which command. Um, so this is essentially it goes through and as you can see, it, it gives um, the, it gives a Boolean value across your data frame um, in order to be able to, uh, when it compares the logical and relational conditions that we're about to state. So when it compares them, it goes through, goes, oh, that one's true, and then flags that for subsetting. So what we're going to do is we're going to select from data. And here, this time, you see that we need to use the syntax of um, dollar sign and then the column name, data frame, dollar sign, column name. And equal to two. So um, we're going to select from column one um, values that are equal to two. Yeah, and then or. We're going to select where data in the data frame data and in column three when it's equal to six. And then what we have to do in this uh, using this syntax is add a comma at the end. This is just that we create. Um, essentially blank arguments. It's just a strange quirk of the subsetting syntax with, um, with R. But this is, is the most malleable way to be able to extract um, data from um, subset data within data frames in R. So if I run that, ooh, that hasn't See, that would be because there are none. <laughs> um, let's just change this to one and just let's get some values that are actually in there. Okay, so yeah, I'll pick, pick some values that are definitely in there. Okay. So what we then get, if we look at data, um, so what it's done is it has extracted the rows where our conditions were met and it's extracted the whole rows in order to maintain the shape of the data frame. So we said, I want you to extract, uh, to subset the data where I have um, in column V1, a uh, value of one and where in column three, in column V3, I have a value of eight and it's extracted the whole rows, it's maintained the rows for where that, that is true. Um, so yeah, this is a very quick 
um, way to be able to subset your data frames. And this works with and operators, with not operators, um, for all the sorts of, um, all of the uh, relational comparisons. Um, and it works much, much better than the subset function. Um, don't be tempted to, to use that. You will find it severely limited. Everybody uses this syntax here. Um, so that's one that's worth keeping a, a, a bookmark on if you're doing lots of uh, data transformation work in, in Python, in Python, in R. <laughs> okay. Right, got about 20 minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll stop for lunch. Um, so we've still got a few bits to get through um, before we do the exercise. And I promise this, this is all the, um, it's going to be a bit more fun this afternoon. <laughs> we'll do, do a nice exercise kind of using what you've learned today, um, this morning, and um, then look a bit more at uh, some plotting um, and perhaps some statistics if we have time. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at merging and appending data. This is this is always one of those tasks which um, you know we need to uh, take columns and blend our data sets and concatenate them together in different shapes. Um, and so you get things like the V stack and H stack methods within um, uh, I think that's is that NumPy and um, there are equivalents in R. So just clear this. So what we can do is we can, when we want to um, bind together, and I use bind because that's the functions that we're using. So this is where we want to bring together um, matrices and add them on to each other. So I'm just going to create a quick matrix. So we'll call it A, matrix A. Um, and that's going to contain the values one, two, three, and four, uh, with the number of rows equal to two. Okay. Just run that. And then we're going to, I'm going to create a, uh, another column that I want to, uh, or sorry, another row of data that I want to add to A. So I'm going to call this B. And this is going to be a vector containing five and six. So you can see that we got this matrix. It's one, two, three, four. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create C, which I'm going to bind together A and B. And we're going to do this by rows. So we use R bind is the function that we use here. And we're going to R bind A and B. Ooh, let's create B first. And then we'll bind them. And so now you can see that we get three rows that bound this to the bottom here. So it's a nice, simple, easy command when working with matrices to just be able to use to use R bind. Um, and then similarly, um, we can, uh, for example, do, uh, uh, let's do D and we can use C bind and we can bind A and B. 
And what we get when we run this is that we can see now that it's added B as a column instead of as a row. So it's just that difference, R bind and C bind. Okay, if we are adding observations to just a single vector, um, so more like, uh, so a vector like B here, we can use the append function, which is similar to um, the lists uh, that you get in, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's similar to, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's called append. So <clears throat> let's um, do, let's call uh, E and we're going to append A and B. So if I do that, you can see that E is now one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's just a single vector. Okay. So we can also do this with um, data frames. And so I'm going to, uh, this is a little bit too much code for you to um, kind of type along, but this is all on uh, R for healthcare and you'll be able to see what's happening. But I'll run through and show you an example of um, doing this with data frames. So what I'm going to do is just create some a data frame quickly. So, so what I've done is just created a data set with a patient, age, treatment, and center. And we've got 100 observations of that. Uh, and so this is just kind of some random fake data that I've created. And what I also want to do now, I'm going to create a second data frame. So this one has the BMI and the gender of each patient. Whereas in our first one, we just had their age, treatment and center. So we got two slightly different data frames, which have the same numbers of observations and they're for the same cohort of patients, shall we say. Okay. So what I want to do now is basically bring these two data frames together. Um, adding one to the other. And for this, we can use function merge. Okay. So the way that the merge function works is that it takes the input arguments of the data frames that you want to merge. So here it's clinical trial one and clinical trial two. And what I want to merge it is on X is by patient and Y by patient as well. So that's the two data frames they're both by. This is giving the, um, the column name here, patient. We're merging it based on patient index. These are ordered, but by merging it in this way, if these were unsorted, and it might be they're all jumbled up um, and not in order. It would match the um, ID in patient to uh, on each data frame and merge it based on that. Okay, and there's the option to work with all of the values or just a subset of them as well. 
So if I run that, what we then get is just we get uh, the age treatment center, BMI and gender columns all there. But what you'll notice is that we haven't just squashed the two data frames together. It has gone through and matched based on the patient number um, and, career, and deleted one of the patient columns. So it's not replicated patient here as you'd have thought it might do, um, it's, it's just remove that. So it's a clean, kind of a clean merge um, matching on patient using that as the index and adding the other columns that we want. Okay. So if we just wanted to add a single column, not multiple columns, but just, just one column. We're creating some new data. Um, so basically, I'm going to um, create some random data, kind of category, numerical category data um, about uh, patients' GP that they're assigned to. So I'm going to call that GP. And I'm going to replicate uh, the numbers one to five 20 times. Okay, so if I run that, I've got now got 100 observations of the numbers one to five repeated 20 times. Sean, sorry, question on the chat. Uh, somebody's yeah. asked um, if uh, essentially if you've got a patient record that's in one data set but not in the other, how does it deal with that? Um, it will probably just fill it with NAs. Um, right. yeah. uh, that's a very good point. Um, how does it deal with that? Um, yeah, it would likely be an NA. Um, that would be my guess as well, I think. <laughs> that would be my guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, match on patient, and a yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd I'd have thought it would have handled it like that. It wouldn't throw an error. It shouldn't throw an error. Just um, wondering, Sean, is the um, argument all equals true? Giving the um, that decision about whether you still keep all your data or if if there isn't a match. Um, all equals true is. Um, Uh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd have to look at the documentation. Um, I, I've just looked it up. I've looked it up, Sean. It, it yeah. will fill it with NAs, apparently. It will fill it with yeah. NAs. I thought it would do. That's, uh, yeah, that's normally the one. Okay, right. <clears throat> um, so, uh, Right, if we're just looking to add a single column to um, our data set, we can do that using CBind, uh, like we did with uh, the matrices. And so we can do um, we can do uh, CBind, and then we just name the data frame and the column that we wish to join to it. So you can see that clinical trial four now has GP added to it. Okay. Um, in terms of rows, it's the same for R bind. Um, So what I can do is, here's one I prepared earlier. I can add, create a new row. Got the data for a row, all the different, so just adding a, a new patient in. 
and then I can use our bind to add that in. And they get added to the bottom here. Patient 101. Okay, so it's actually relatively easy as long as you've got the right data type um, because it's remembering that with a column, um, it won't let you, if you've got a column of numerical data, it won't let you add a string to it. It'll be the wrong data type. So um, just making sure that your um, data types are matching when you're adding columns, uh, when you're adding rows, um, and that whether you're adding rows or columns that you've got the right number of uh, data points in there. Um, yeah, they won't normally add NAs to the bottom. It will tell you that your data is the wrong shape if you're trying to bind a, um, a column to a data frame, but your column isn't long enough. Um, you've got to make sure that you've got the right number of uh, rows or the right number of elements in your vector. Okay. <clears throat> right. Let's um, let's break there. Uh, I know it's quite a lot of information, and um, we are going to go through uh, sorting of data, working with dates and times, tables, um, and for and while loops. While loops, um, and a little bit on user-defined functions. We'll do that after lunch, and then. We'll do exercise one, which uh, is, is a decently chunky one. I'll give you an opportunity to uh, use some of these this functionality a lot more. And then we'll see what time we've got left this afternoon to look at some plotting and statistics as well. Super. So um, if everybody can be back at half past one, that will be fantastic. We'll start promptly at half past one. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, are you leaving this open? Do you want us to stay on or, or do you want to, are you going to close it? Uh, do you know what? I'll just leave it on. There's, uh, yeah, there's no point stopping it. As everybody's connected, we'll just leave it on. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thank you. So just before we get started, um, just going to say, so see, so, um, I showed you earlier, there's the, um, the Alpha Healthcare website, which has all of the materials on. There's in the GitLab repository, you've got um, all of the uh, materials and uh, exercises, some data in there. Um, yeah, if you're, um, there, there's loads, so much material for R and learning R online. Um, uh, there's uh, the R data camp, um, which is an excellent resource with loads of worked examples. Um, you know, what I'm showing you today is very much base R, kind of the, the simple bits of it all um, and yeah this is all the underpinnings that you really need to know um, a lot of training courses will go straight in and start teaching you um, using packages and what happens a lot of the time is that you can get so far using packages but as soon as you've got to do data manipulation and transformation People don't know how to do that, how to go about subsetting the data, um, getting array sizes, unique values, all these kinds of um, things, you know, uh, indexing arrays. Um, so, yeah, in the advanced star session, we're going to look more at the use of packages. Um, and that will be kind of more of a uh, kind of Oh yeah, okay, you understand the basics, but here's some more complex stuff that we can do on top of it. Um, 
but getting getting to understand the basics is is what's required first of all and hopefully this will help you see the differences and similarities with python and when you can understand more than one la pro uh, one programming language it, then actually your understanding of programming expands because you're really understanding the general concepts such as data structures um, data types um, and the uh, manipulation of arrays um, which is kind of what it's all really based on and then uh, kind of logical programming so um, yeah in the advanced star session we'll actually be looking at um, we'll be looking at advanced plotting with uh, ggplot2 and making very nice pretty graphs then we'll be looking at distribution fitting um, which is something that we require uh, really quite often um, and then we'll be looking at uh, shiny as well which is um, the app web app building um, package for R and we'll be building a, a distribution fitting app in that so that'll be a bit more kind of, of a uh, creative session and extending and building on what we've learnt in this session here today okay so hopefully everybody's back now and I'm going to get on with looking at sorting data. That's our next topic. So yeah, um, so R has some built-in data sets in it and we can bring those into R using the data function. And there's one in there called US arrests the rest properly and if we bring that in oh no use the right button okay so this is um a data set with um it, for every state we've got uh the murder rate the assault rate and um the population. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, kind of one of these standardized data sets that, uh, that you get with these languages. And we're going to um, look at this and just kind of do some different sorting functions on it. Um, so first of all, I'm going to attach the data set so that because it's a data frame, I can attach it and use it as a um, uh, so that I don't have to add the column uh, that I don't have to add the data frame name every time. And what I'm going to do is what we can do is sort and we can sort simply just a, uh, a single column and it will just sort it in ascending order. So um, if I do urban pop, which is one of the columns and oh, it's got a capital P and that's why. And you can see that that just sorts the urban populations um, as so, and just gives us the values, the population values. So sort is just a generic command, just sort a single, single vector of data in ascending order. If we want to sort by more than one column, our syntax has to be a bit different. So what we're going to do, I'm going to call this sort one uh, US arrests. And it's similar to the subsetting syntax in that we first of all give the data frame 
name. Then we use square brackets because this is what we want the uh, the uh, kind of the sorting or you know transformation of the data frame to be. And what we're going to do is we're going to order this. So we want it to change the ordering, and we're going to order it on urban pop and then by murder. And then we just put a comma at the end as we did with subsetting. And if I run that now, we get the sorted data frame. So it's sorted, first of all, based on murder, um, murder rate and then the urban population. No, sorry, it's the urban population first, then by the murder rate. So we can see that it's first of all sorted on urban population and then sorted by the murder rate. Classic US statistics. Okay. So that's kind of the simple way to sort by two or more columns. Um, if we put a minus in front of one of these, in fact, I'll, uh, I'll copy this, just change the data frame name, make it number two. And if I put a minus in front of murder, then what it will do is sort it in the opposing order. So um, we should do anyway. Yes, so it sorts by urban population. And then as we can see here, where we got two with 44 as urban population, then Mississippi is given uh, as the first one as that has the higher murder rate. So it's quite easy to change that ascending, descending order um, when sorting. Okay, and that and that's sorting. That that is sorting in um, in R. It's quite quite a simple process. In some ways, it's a little bit simpler than uh, than in Python. Don't tell Mike that though. That's, um, I'm still here. Still... Uh, Sean, oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure the Python sort is much better. <laughs> oh yes, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so so that's basic sorting. You've got the sort command when you're sorting by a single column, and uh, you've got uh, the order when you're sorting by multiple columns. Okay. Moving on. Okay, working with dates and times. Now, <clears throat> a lot of uh, healthcare data includes date and time information. So we need to be able to handle these. And as we've seen in, um, in Python, that it's, you do have to be, you have to treat dates and times differently. Um, and it's the same in R. So what I'm going to start with, um, this is one uh, I've, I've prepared earlier, some, um, some data for this. Um, so I'm just going to run this and get a, so I've got a data frame with an ID and a date of birth. And there's 10 observations of this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attach the, uh, the data, data frame. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to do uh, DOB, so the date of birth column, 
I'm going to take the first value and I'm going to try and minus another date from it. So we'll do the 23rd for the third, 45. Um, well, 1945, I've got to put. And then it's the same format. Oh, let's get it exactly the same format. OK. Now, what it says is it would get a warning message here saying they're not meaningful for factors. Basically, it's not recognizing the dates as dates. So we need to tell R that what we're working with in the date of birth column is dates. So how we do this is we I'm going to create a you could could overwrite the column, but I'm going to create a new column um, with dates. So uh, I'm going to do date. This is a new date of birth column. Uh, Dob int and assign using the as date function. And I'm going to do transform. The data, the DOB data birth column in our DF, in our data frame to a particular format. And as with Python, we need to tell it what the format is that the data, um, the, uh, the date is coming in as. So we use, again, it's actually exactly the same syntax that we use the percentage sign followed by, in this instance, a little d, um, which is day of the month. Then we put in our separator, which in this instance is a forward slash, no, backslash, forward slash, yeah, I always forget. Um, um, and uh, then um, we're going to use percent and m, little m uh, to say uh, that that's the month uh, and then slash again and then we use percent and because we've got the long year we use a capital Y if it was just the second part um, of the date um, just say 07 or 46 then we'd use a small y but as default, um, R defaults to the 1990s. Um, so if you have dates from in the 2000s and that, they, they won't get picked up on correctly and you'll have to do adjustments. Um, this is why we always need to make sure that the full year um, is there when we're collecting our data in the first instance. So now I've got, uh, so I'm going to transform this column and I can see that DOB int is a date format. It tells me that's what the date is and then we've got them in as dates. And so this format that we're giving the as date function is how the date is coming in. That, will, that is not how the date will be formatted in our data. It will be formatted year first, month, day, and hyphens in between. OK. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, the, uh, the original date of birth and uh, add the transformed data to a single data frame. So I'm going to call it df birth one and assign to that data dot frame. So I'm creating a new data frame. I'm not actually adding, I'm bringing together two data frames to make a new data frame. This is just another way of doing the same thing. Dob int and df birth. And when I run that, I can see that I get DOB int, the ID, and 
uh, the original date of birth. And we can see this difference in formatting of the dates. Okay. <clears throat> if we want to look at, just a little hint, if we want to look at the, uh, the structure, the underlying structure, uh, all this detail that we have our in, in our environment, plus a little bit more, um, we can uh, look, we can use the function str, which is structure. And so we want to look at the structure of our data frame. We can do df birth one within that. And when we run that down in the console, you can see we've got 10 observations of three variables. And we've got the column dov int, um, which is date and format and then ID, which is an integer and values, and DOB, which is a factor. So how the data was read in originally, um, dates were read in as factors, which is why we've got to transform them. Okay, so that's how we, when we read in dates and we tr make sure that they are understandable by R. Um, now, what if we want to do something with them? So let's have a go at um, getting the weekdays. We might want to know what day of the week it was uh, on that particular date. So I'm going to create a new variable day and assign to that these uh, the weekdays. And the function for that is weekdays, a nice, uh, nice simple one. Um, so we use the function weekdays and we add the argument, what, which is our, um, our column that we want to, uh, uh, to get the weekdays for. So if I do, so df birth one dollar sign dob int and run that. I now get a vector of the days on which um, those dates occurred. So if I just bring that up in the console to see the full thing. We've got Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Saturday, Monday, Friday, Thursday, Saturday, Saturday, Monday. So this is the kind of thing that actually is quite handy <clears throat> when you want to know the days of the week, if you're looking for particular trends in your data, perhaps, um, that you want to be able to determine what the um, uh, kind of weekly cycles in uh, trends of, for example, emergency departments attendances might be. Um, and this is used quite a lot in um, for forecasting when you're looking at uh, particular trends in the data. Okay. Um, we can also get just a random one that we can find out um, how many uh, days have occurred. Just trying to understand that. Oh yeah, no, actually, let's ignore that. Let's ignore me there. Um, there are a number of other date functions as well as weekdays. If you look at the uh, date time documentation around R, there, there's a lot there. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, move on to, um, because that's quite, self-explanatory, there's functionality. Once you've converted to that as date format, you can play around with dates as much as you want. When we're including time, we need to change the format again because that is different. So um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do, I'll just show you an example that I built earlier because it's a little bit to write. So I'm, here I'm assigning to the variable time um, two dates with timestamps on them. 
And the function that we're using to do this is as POSIX, that's not a nice one to say. Um, it's not a nice one to remember either. Um, but when working with date time data, this is the function that you want to be using um, as um, P O S I X C T. Um, and it must be spelled like that with the capitalization and lowercase letters. That's the function for working with date time stamps. And here again, we give the format as we did before. Um, here we use the keyword argument format and we give the date, uh, the day, month and year as we did previously. But then we need to give the hours, minutes and seconds format as well. And these, if, if I run this, so we get a vector of time, uh, time date format data. Then what I can do is, for example, do time two minus time. And so I'm using the first value in our time, um, time vector and the second value. And so minusing the first value from the second value. And if I run that, it tells me, and it even actually tells me that there's a time difference of minus 460.8 days. So um, it will only work, R, R will only properly work with time date data in these particular formats, either as date, it's just a date, or POSIX as it's if it's a um, time date data. Okay. <clears throat> so there are some um, slight differences in the format and I will point you to look at um, the materials on Alpha Healthcare because there are some subtle differences um, in whether you're uh, looking at, for example, British Summertime, GMT, um, whether you're including uh, kind of uh, longer uh, nanoseconds in your dates, um, if you're wanting uh, AM and PM on your dates, if they're, if they're in that format, um, or if it's in 24 hour clock. Um, so there's bits to, uh, there's a lot of subtlety to it, which I don't have time to go through now. That is something if you are using R for time date format data, highly recommend look at R for healthcare, look at the documentation um, and go through and, and get your head around what is the most appropriate function for the data that I'm working with. But yeah, there's one of those that we do a lot with and as long as you pick the right transformation function to get so that R understands your time date data, you'll be fine. That's, uh, it, it works really well and you can perform all the, all the different calculations that you'll want to with that and extract a lot of information. Okay. So jumping about, I am so just clear the screen. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of tables um, and how we quickly and easily create um, tables of counts within um, of uh, information that's contained within our data frames. So I am again just going to create a quick data set. So again, this is the clinical trial data that I showed you earlier. Same, same data, the 100 observations. And I'm going to 
attach this. And what I'm interested in, first of all, is to know how many people are in the treatment groups and how many are in the control groups. So let's find out. It's, uh, so here I simply use the command table and put in the column treatment because I've attached the clinical trial data frame. Otherwise, it would be clinical trial dollar treatment. But just doing that, oh, that's, um, okay. And down here on the console, you can see that uh, we've got treatment 50, control 50, which is as I've expected. There's a 50 50 split between control and treatment in this data set. Okay. Sometimes um, we want to look at things by two different um, tables, something by two different factors within our data set. So for example, we can use table and then, so we want to look at treatment and then let's also look at um, which center they've been assigned to. And in this instance, I can also add some names to help it help me see which one's which. Um, and so I do this just by adding some labels in DNN, which is a keyword argument that basically means my names. Um, And so I've got treatments and centers. So this is just going to label my table for me. And you can see now down the bottom here that we get treatments and centers. And I've got treatment and control and each center A, B, C, D, and E. And the counts tabulated for um, how many uh, people are in each condition at each center. So table, uh, extremely easy um, function to use and uh, just quick and handy just to be able to tabulate the counts within your data. So um, I can also um, make this a data frame very quickly and easily. Um, so I can convert a table to just pull that up there. I can convert a table. So I've got a table of treatment and center as we did before. And I can create it as a data frame. And the response name argument um, gives us the, the, what are we getting out of it? These are the counts. Um, so when I look at this, we get treatment, center, and then the counts, which we told it that's that's what we want you to name our column that you're get, that we're getting out here. Um, and so that just puts it directly into a data frame that you can immediately export should you want to. Okay. Um, and that's tables. Um, again, look at the documentation. There is more complex stuff that you can do, but quite often um, what you want to do is just be counting up counts of uh, categories and that'll get you started. Um, so moving on to um, loops. Um, we're almost there, just a couple of topics left to go. And um, so looking at loops, loops are one of the uh, so useful, it's really powerful just to be able to iterate through our data. Um, R is a funny thing, and if you get into using R, you'll find out very quickly. Um, R is not designed specifically to be used with loops. Um, because of the way that it's constructed, um, 
there are a family of functions called the apply family. And there is a, um, a whole load of information on Arthur Healthcare about apply. Um, it gets a little bit in depth to go into it. I'd recommend reading it on your own if you're serious about using R. Otherwise, you're better off just using for loops for simple things. Um, but uh, the apply statements basically are loops that work faster using the background code of uh, that ours and the structure that ours programmed in. Um, it's all to do the way with the way that it treats matrices again. Um, but yeah, it's worth for the moment just understanding loops. And if you are getting into R, have a look at the apply uh, family. Okay. So let's have a little look at for loops. There's, uh, I'm going to just create um, just a simple vector of data. So X and I want numbers one to 10. Nice and simple. And what we're going to do then is um, I'm going to create um, some uh, a vector of zeros using the rep function. So I'm going to replicate a series of a vector of zeros. And I want them to be the length of x. <clears throat> so I want 10 zeros. And that gives me my 10 zeros. Just a little example there of combining other functions that we've used earlier. So the replication and the length function there. And so what I want to do is go through, I, I want to create a loop to go through and add numbers to x and assign them to y. And the reason why I've created y, which is a um, vector of zeros, is for pre-allocation. This means that I'm creating 10 spaces where I'm going to put numbers. Um, it's a computationally faster way to do things, to pre-allocate the space for where you're going to put numbers, if you know how many numbers you're going to create. So to write a for loop, um, we just, we write for in a space and we open some curved brackets. Then we use i in. So i is just, that's our placeholder, our number. Same, same as in Python. We use i to say this is, this is going to be the uh, our for loop counter. And I want to, for i in 1 to the length of x. So I want to go all the way through x, remembering that r starts counting at 1. Going from 1 to the length of x, which is 10. And then we use curly, curly braces to open up what we're going to do do within the for loop. So this is the same as our if statement. And I'm going to say, I want you to put in to y at the element i. So this will go through the elements 1, 2, 3, 4 to 10. I want you to assign x I, so picking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I want you to add I to it. So this is just making use of our loop counter to iterate through our X variable, do something with it, in this case, making use of I, um, and assign it to, um, uh, to an element in y 
into the respective element in Y. So this is just that common format for iterating through um, something and iterating something out. And so if I run this, see, we get in Y, we now have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And so it's gone through, it's added i to x for the respective element and then put it in the right place in our variable y. OK. Uh, and that's, that's for loops, um, basically. They are that simple. Uh, that is the syntax. It's just remembering, remembering your curved brackets um, and that we have our counter, our in statement, and then the range over which we want to um, iterate, how many times we want to do something. And it's just this thing of using curly, bracket, curly braces um, instead of a colon as you uh, that you would in Python. Okay, so um, I will just give you, uh, we'll just do a quick example of a while loop as well, which is uh, again extremely similar. I think you're getting the pattern now. So what I'm going to use is uh, I'm going to do said. In fact, actually, let's just use X. Um, so we'll do while i is less than six. So we're using our um, relational operator there, less than. I'm going to open the curly braces uh, and I'm going to add in here y, are we going to do the same again, y, i, and assigning the ith element of x plus i. And then I'll run this. And hang on, that, that didn't seem to, let's, uh, let's just reset Y and run that again. Oh, it doesn't seem to have done anything. It hasn't changed Y. Yeah, it hasn't worked on mine either. It hasn't, has it? Well, this is because, oh. <laughs> while loops, <laughs> so, sorry, Dan, set you up there. Um, <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is because, um, while loops, because they don't actually use, um, it's not like a for loop where i is actually a variable that's stored within the loop and used as a counter. While loops don't do that, you have to assign an external counter. So what I have to do is outside before the while loop, I have to say i and assign number one as a starting point to it. And then within my while loop, I will say i, and I want to in increment i by one each time it completes. And if you notice here, just a little bit of programming thing, what I've done is I've, because I, I could have set i to zero and had the counter above where I'm assigning something to y. So it counts it as, as the function starts. But I've done it afterwards, so I make it one instead of zero. Okay. So if I would if I run this this time, we can see over here on the right the y is gone through and done two, four, six, eight, ten, and then stopped as we've got, it's hit six and seeing that i is greater than, or is equal to six and it's stopped. 
Okay. So yeah, it's just that little um, remembering with while loops that you have to put your own counter in to count the while there, how many times it's going to iterate. It doesn't do it automatically. Okay. Right, last last topic, and then uh, I am going to turn it, the things over to you. So, um, what I want to talk about just briefly is user-defined functions, and just show you the syntax for this, um, just so that you can get your, uh, just so that you're familiar with this. Okay. So again, it's very similar to Python. And we can, so, so we just, we write our function and basically what we do is we give it a name. First of all, I'm gonna call it name pets. And then the assignment operator. And we use the function, function. And this says, I want to define a new user-defined function. And then what we need to do is determine what the, um, the inputs are going to be to our function and say what they're going to be. So I'm going to do person, cats, and dogs because basically this is going to be the number of uh, cats and dogs that a particular person has. And I'm gonna enter the data for that. And like we used with the if statement and the for statements and the for loop, um, we use, we contain what we want to happen within curly brackets. So where you're using a colon in Python, you use curly brackets in so what I'm going to do is I just want um, our uh, inputs to be assigned to a variable called result and I want it to list out person, cats and dogs. Nothing complicated. It's there. And the final thing that we need to remember to add in here is a return statement. Same as with Python, when we have a function, we need to return something from it. And here we return, we're returning result. Um, a major difference between R and Python, because what they're built to do, basically R only returns one thing from a function. It, you can't use a comma and return multiple variables. You can only return one thing. Um, to overcome this, what you'd normally do is you would create a list and add your, all your different, uh, whether you have data frames or um, vectors, you know, uh, different pieces of information that you're returning from a function, you'd return them as a single list and then unlist them um, when out, outside in another fun, in a when you go to use them. So um, right, okay. So basically, that's our function. And now, if I run that, you'll see that over in the environment, we get something new that says functions. And this gives our function name, name pets, and the inputs that we require. And so now what I can do is I want to do, okay, um, let's do details. And I'm going to assign to that. I'm going to run the function name pets. And I'm going to say, Andrew as Andy has the greatest number of pets out of all of us and 
then I'm going to input, he's got definitely at least four cats. And I'm not sure zero if there's any dogs. <laughs> Z zero dogs. There's, uh... No, no, no. I was, I was saying add a zero to the end of cats. That's probably... <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> there's a few. There's a few <laughs> kicking about. That's, um, and I think it might be one dog. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure at the moment. It does fluctuate. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is my input data. And when I press that, I get details returned because the result has been assigned to my uh, variable details. And I've got that stored there as a, a string, uh, as a vector of characters containing the three um, pieces of information that I wanted. And that's how you write user-defined functions. That's the syntax for user-defined functions in R. It's just very simple, very similar to Python. It's just remembering you can only output one thing at a time from a function, which is not a bad thing because it actually makes you only kind of standard convention says that within any user-defined function, you should only be doing one thing and really outputting only one thing from a function. They should be very specific. If you're doing more things, then you should have more functions. Um, so it's, it kind of keeps you a little bit to, to that, just write very short, snippy functions that, you know, they just, they do one thing and produce what they do, simple things and produce one output. Um, and yeah, just uh, keep, keep them nice and simple. Um, but it's just remembering Yep, your inputs, um, and just remembering to use the correct names when referring to your inputs within the uh, operation of the function, and then making sure you've got your return statement. Okay. Right, that is all of our basic functionality in R. Uh, that is quite a lot and it's plenty to get you started for certain. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to you now. Um, okay. What I'm gonna do is I will post in a moment on Slack the data set for this. So this exercise um, it's basically just to try and um, use and get you thinking in an R-based way and to get you using um, the functions that we've looked at so far. So what we get in this exercise, what you're going to do, you're going to import some data. You're going to subset the data, create a table out of it. Um, and create a loop, uh, a for loop uh, to analyze uh, lengths of stay within the data. Okay, so there are, I will admit there are, there's one thing I think that we haven't covered in here, and that's kind of purposefully in there. Have a Google, um, you know, is, is to go, okay, when you come across something that you haven't seen before, you know, have a look and I think you'll work out quite easily how to um, how to fix this. Um, but there is one thing that is missing. Um, yeah, can you spot it? <laughs> or you will spot it. You'll go, ah, oh, how do we do that? Um, okay, so what I think I'll do is I will split you into uh, groups in breakout rooms. Uh, how many people have we got today? Let's just have a look. We've got 33, is it? So I'll do groups of about, um, about four or five and go through, work up scripts to, to do each of these things. And then we'll come back, we'll have a little chat about it. Um, and then we'll have a look at, if we've got time, look at some of the, the advanced uh, stuff. So I think if give you until, let's go with five past 
yeah, fun time. Okay, let's come back at quarter past three and take a kind of five, 10 minute uh, comfort break in that for yourselves as well. And yeah, we'll come back at quarter past three. So it's 3.15 and we'll go through your answers. So I will split you up now. Uh, it's just, I'll put the, I will, um, I'll also share the, um, the exercise through Slack as well now. So, and just see how you get on.